second Sunday of the new year. Just a few things before we uh, get started this morning. Uh, the deacons will meet immediately after uh, worship this morning in, uh, in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, a huge big thanks to uh, Bill Cooper who got our social or fellowship hall painted. If you haven't been in there, um, go in there and look. It looks fantastic and he's getting ready to start on some other things. Uh, also, Grief Share started this past week. I appreciated the elders that were able to come here for that and hope that uh, you'll be able to continue to come. Um, that's on Tuesday night. And if you know somebody who could benefit from that program, please, please come. And uh, Bible study tonight. Uh, so if you're reading through the Bible with us, uh, we're in Job. Uh, we're soon to finish Job. And um, we're going to be talking about that book in extensive uh, detail tonight. So come to Bible study. It's a great way to kind of recap. I noticed, uh, so we, we've been using that um, Bible recap app uh, or podcast. Some people do to kind of go with their Bible reading. And I noticed in, on Fox News online this morning, uh, that it is the number one podcast amongst all podcasts of every category in, uh, in America. So um, uh, it just speaks to the need for uh, us to go through Scripture and to understand what Scripture is and the hunger that's out there. And so uh, come uh, tonight at 530 as we continue our, uh, our, our Bible study. Before we open, uh, there is one thing that um, I'd like to do. Uh, this past uh, December, we, uh, for the first time uh, in a long time, elected a new treasurer. And Walter Jones and David Irwin have served this church faithfully for so many years. I think Walter was treasurer for 28 years, and David was assistant treasurer for 20 years. And so I'd like to ask those two men to come down, if they would, um, right now to the front. We have a, uh, come on up here, Walter. We have a plaque for, for, for both of them. Uh, Walter says uh, to Walter Jones with, Grateful uh, thanks and appreciation for 28 years of faithful service to God and our church as treasurer, December 31st, uh, 2023. And so, Walter, I'd like to give that to you. And David, yours uh, only says 20 years, I'm sorry, but you, were, <laughs> you, you served us so faithfully uh, for 20 years. So we wanted to recognize both of you gentlemen and to express our appreciation for your love for Christ, but your love also for this church and your willingness to go above and beyond and to, and to serve and to give. And while this is by no means, uh, I know, the end of, of service from you two to this church in one way or another, uh, we did as a congregation and particularly as a session want to express our deep appreciation to you guys uh, for such such faithful service and so let me say thank you to both of you and absolutely join everybody as well so then thank you denise you have big shoes big shoes to fill Our call to worship this morning comes from 1 Peter. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, 
to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. We praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord of all the earth. We worship you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers in it. To you, the cherubim and seraphim continually cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of your glory. The glorious company of the apostles praises you. The good fellowship of the prophets praises you. The noble army of the martyrs praise you. And your church acknowledges you, the father of infinite majesty. And so speak to us this day as we come into your sanctuary. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. If you will stand with me this morning and turn to page three, we will sing Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, all four verses, please. <clears throat> prayer of confession this morning, I want to use a prayer that has been written by the great Puritan Richard Baxter. Hear and pray with me as we confess our sins. O most great 
most just and gracious God, <clears throat> you are of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. You condemn the ungodly, unrepentant, and unbelievers, but you have promised mercy for those through Christ Jesus to all who repent and believe in him. Therefore, we confess that we are sinful by nature and have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have neglected and abused your holy worship and your holy name. We have dealt unjustly and uncharitably with our neighbors. We have not sought first the kingdom and righteousness. You have not been content with our we have not been content with our daily bread. We have revealed your you have revealed your wonderful love to us in Christ and offered us pardon and salvation in him. But we have turned away. We have run into temptation and the sin that we should hate we've committed. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. We confess alone that our hope is in you. Make us your children and give us the spirit of your Son, our only Savior. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Glory be to the Father. If you'd like to read along, our Old Testament reading is on 618 in your pew Bible. I'll be reading Psalm 139, 1 through 6. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know where I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path my lying down, and my acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Our next hymn this morning is on page 563. Open my eyes that I may see if you will scan and sing with me once again. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Let's go down to our New Testament reading for today. John 1, 43 through 51. It's on page 1054 if you want to follow along. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him who Moses in the law and also the prophecies wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming before him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathan said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him. Before Philip called you, you were under a fig tree. I saw you. Nathan answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. <clears throat> Thank you. As we come to our uh, prayer time uh, this morning, we have a number of things to praise God about. Um, we're thrilled that Becky's here and got a good report. Uh, we're thrilled that Woody is here and Woody got a good report. Um, and did Don get home yesterday? He did. We want to continue to pray for Don Bray, uh, who had some complications, uh, as I understand it, from replacing a pacemaker battery, but he is home now, continue to uh, pray. Today's his birthday, by the way, and so uh, be sure you text Don today and tell him uh, happy birthday. Um, we, as we continue to pray for our folks. Uh, Jeff uh, goes to um, Partridge, uh, goes to the, uh, uh, the, the doctor this week, and there are others, some of which don't want their issues kind of broadcast what's going on with them, but um, I would just ask that you would uh, uh, pray for for all the, the folks listed here in, uh, in, in your bulletin this morning and um, others who need your, uh, your watch care uh, over us. I would ask you also to uh, uh, just to, to pray for my family in these days as we go through a number of things um, as a family, we would ask for for your prayer um, a, a, as well. Let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Lord, we would thank you for the good report that so many have gotten this week or those that have finished uh, treatment or those that have been in the midst of difficulty and you have brought them through, we, we pray for others, Lord, who are in the midst of things, even as I was talking with one this morning, uh, one issue clears only to have another uh, crop up. And so, Father, we pray for all who are in need of your watch care uh, this morning. Father, we certainly would cry out to you for those that are homebound, um, 
and ask that you would be with and bless them, some who are traveling uh, today, that you would be with and bless them on this busy travel weekend. Father, even as we recognize two men who had given so selflessly for so many years to our church, we would pray and ask that you would pour out your goodness to them as they have served you faithfully for so long. Burden them to continue to serve, Lord, in whatever path you now would have them do. And we do pray for the new leadership that comes to our office of treasurer and assistant treasurer that you would be with and bless them but also Lord we rejoice in the fact that um, their willingness to, to, to serve Lord we're praying this month particularly for RUF and uh, at Valdosta State we're praying together that God would superintend the election of officials at all levels of, of government. We, we're praying for the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and to help us understand the Word as we read it this year. Father, I pray for the youth Sunday school class that as we have made a challenge to them on this, the first meeting of the year, that they would take up the challenge, that you would be with and bless when and Becca and Seth and Aiden in these days, Lord, as we journey in your word together. Be with our adult Sunday school as well and Roger as he leads that. Father, we just come asking for your watch care over this church, praising you for the goodness of your grace to us the abounding mercy that comes from our relationship with you. And so, Father, we cry out with all of this before your holy name, for we ask it in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our <coughs> Lord and Savior. Amen. As our ushers come forward to receive our offering, we would just be reminded that we are called to tithe and tithe generously to the Lord.
for the blessings that you have given to this church, the overwhelming um, love that you have poured out. And so, Father, we pray that you would uh, bless these tithes and offerings to the furtherance of your kingdom, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. You have your Bibles there. Um, if you'll turn to Matthew 26, Matthew 26, you'll find that on page 988 in your pew Bible. If you're using that Bible this morning, I would. Tell you this morning that as we begin to return to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, we took a break for <clears throat> a number of weeks uh, from the Gospel of Matthew to look at forgiveness. We want to come back to Matthew. We're going to pick up at a really critical point uh, in Matthew's Gospel. We've come through the five teaching discourses that Matthew has. And now we come to this point where he's completed all that he wants to write about the public ministry of Jesus. And he's going to pivot or turn to a detailed look at the passion of Christ, that is, his death, resurrection, and ascension. Now, I want to say, that, and it might be helpful as, as we jump into chapter 26 this morning, I want to remind all of you that, that most scholars believe that the gospel writers used a collection, an oral collection, of Jesus' sayings that were kept not in any chronological order. The logia was the words of Jesus, and the gospel writers used them as a source, amongst other things, under the inspiration of the Spirit, to write their gospels. That's why we sometimes find different uh, events or sayings of Jesus plugged in at different places in the various gospels. John probably is one of the most chronological, although he's not perfectly chronological in his uh, writing. And so these oral sayings were kept and used by the apostles for different purposes because their books were written for different reasons. Each gospel had a different audience. Each gospel had a, a, a different purpose. They are not biographies of Jesus. They are more portraits of Jesus painted for a specific audience. And, of course, Matthew's is to show that Jesus, in the line of Abraham and David, is the Messiah of the Jews. And the story that we're going to uh, look at today is found in Matthew, Mark, and John, all in somewhat different places. But we're going to refer to all of them, for I believe it is the same story. And to kind of complicate it up front, Luke has a a, a similar story, but it's not the same story 
his story takes place at a different place and with a different person. But we are in Bethany. Jesus has come. Holy Week has, has happened, right? We are on the, the verge of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. And so it is into that poignant time that we find our passage today. So as we come to chapter 26, let's stand in honor of God's word. For we believe and we teach that the Bible is the inspired word of God, infallible and inerrant word. Hear the word of the Lord, beginning in chapter 26, verse 1. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. And the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment. She poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. But you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this your word, but may we see no man save Christ alone, for it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. As we begin the 26th chapter, we have the fourth time in Matthew's gospel where Jesus tells his disciples that he's about to die. Started in 1621 and 1722 and 20, verse 18, and now here. And in each time, if you go back and we don't have time this morning, but if you would go back and look at each of those, the, the details kind of increase. Jesus gives them a little bit more information about what is about to happen. And here he says that the time has come. In two days, I'm going to die. There's never been a more poignant moment in history, has there? What will happen in two days? Well, in two days is the Passover, when all good Jews will gather, kill their sacrificial lamb, and eat their Passover meal. And Jesus is to die as the ultimate 
Passover lamb. How fitting it is that on the day in which those lambs are slain, Jesus will die. He'll die as a part of that seven-day feast. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. That Lamb which has been sacrificed year in and year out since the time of Moses will come to an end when the ultimate sacrificial lamb, the one who eternally fulfills all the law and covenant, will die. But evil is not standing by, is it? We read just after that, after Jesus is telling his disciples that in a couple of days he's going to die, at the same time, the religious elite are plotting how to kill Jesus. Now, this is not the first time we've read that they're plotting <coughs> to kill Jesus. But now they're getting really specific about it. They've looked for times to why they can kind of, when they could kind of arrest him. But now, now they've got it down to a timetable. As soon as the feast is over, as soon as all those Galileans who love Jesus go back to Galilee, as soon as our population in Jerusalem goes from five times its normal level back to its normal level, we clear out all these people who love him. We're going to kill him. So nine days from hence, the seven-day feast, two days So they're talking 11 days, they're going to kill him. Now, what is so astounding to me is that the religious elite, those who are to, to stand and draw the people to God, want to kill God. It's hard for us. It's hard for us to understand how so much hatred could exist, so much pride could exist, so much love for money could exist in the leadership of the Jews, that here on the, the, the very verge of Passover, their mind is not on what God has done for them in the past. Their mind is on killing the Savior of the world. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. fascinating I, I when i was doing this i thought of proverbs 19:21 right many are the plans in the mind of man but it is the purposes of the lord that stand right they want to wait these 11 days or so let the crowds clear out let the passover happen let everything kind of calm down and then they want to kill him but god <laughs> god's got a different timeline how true that is for all of our lives we we plan we map out we we want to do this we want to go there we want to make this happen we want to get to this level that's that's all well and good but god's timeline is always perfect in your life and in mine so what God has ordained is that his son would die as the Passover lamb. And no amount of plotting will change what God has ordained. Well, to me, again, it's, it's so interesting the way Matthew has put all this together. So you've got that 
that group gathered at the palace of the high priest, Caiaphas, who's plotting when and how to, to, to kill Jesus. And then Matthew sticks in this, this other story about Jesus' death, in part. And we are at the house of Simon the leper in Bethany. Now, Jesus was frequently in Bethany. That's where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived. Some, we don't know who Simon the leper is. Perhaps he was a leper that Jesus had healed. Seems very unlikely that he would still be a leper and people gathering with him. He would have been forced to live outside the city. Some scholars believe that it is Lazarus' father. They often ate at Lazarus, Mary, and Martha's house. Jesus did in Bethany. So he is there in this man's house. So as we think about this story, Matthew doesn't name her, but John does. And John names her as Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And that would certainly make sense. And there, as Jesus reclines at the table, she breaks an alabaster flask of very expensive oil, verse 7 says, or ointment, and pours it on his head as he reclines there. We know from elsewhere in Scripture that the value of this flask was one year's labor for an average man. So, if you take what you would make in a year, you didn't spend it on anything else, you bought this one little alabaster flask of ointment that represents a whole year of your life, the work of a whole year, and she breaks it and pours it on Jesus' body. She lavishly anoints Jesus, anointing him, the text says, for his burial. You can just imagine the aroma of this expensive, maybe nard, who knows what exactly it is, but this expensive ointment filling the room, the aroma filling the room as everybody kind of looks to where the smell is coming from, and there they see Mary anointing. Jesus' body there. You know, it seems that, that Mary, Mary knows what's about to happen to Jesus. She's, the, the disciples, they just can't seem to get there, can they? They can't seem to grasp what's about to happen, but but Mary, in anointing his body for his burial, seems to have an understanding of what's about to happen to Jesus. And so we might ask ourselves this morning, how is it that Mary would have a sense to anoint Jesus' body two days or three days or however many th days it is before this, before his burial. What would drive her to do that? And I would simply put a very simple explanation to you. Every time we see Mary in Scripture, She's at the feet of Jesus. If you think about the various stories where we see Mary 
She's always at the feet of Jesus. Think about the time when they have the meal and Martha comes and complains to Jesus, Jesus, make her come help me. You can just see what's going on in the kitchen. Martha's slinging the pouts and pans around because she's doing it all herself and Mary is seated at the feet of Jesus listening to him teach and Jesus says to Martha, 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 Mary has chosen better. When Lazarus dies and Martha comes up to Jesus and stands there and kind of berates him and says, you know, if you'd been here, this wouldn't happen. But when, when Mary hears that, that Jesus is there, she comes out and falls on her knees at his feet. She's there always at the feet of Jesus, learning. So it should be no surprise to us that here she is again at the feet of Jesus, anointing his body. And you know, it's the same for us today. The application of all this is pretty straightforward. If we want to know who Jesus is, we have to be at the feet of Jesus. So what do we mean by that? What do I mean when I urge you to be at Jesus' feet each and every day? Well, we can't be at his actual feet, but we can be at the feet of his word. We can be men and women of the book. We can be reading what it means to be a servant of Christ. To know Jesus, to have that personal growing relationship with Him, you have to be at His feet. You have to make time. In Sunday school this morning when I had the kids, we were talking about relationships, and I asked each one, Tell me about your relationship with your best friend. How do you keep that relationship going? And every one of them said, we spend time together. If you want a personal relationship that is growing with Jesus Christ, you must spend time with him. And if you want a growing relationship with Jesus, he must be not only your best friend, but your priority. It can't be I'll get to a devotion time today. It has to be let me do my devotion so I can properly go to all the other things that I have to do today. And so I would remind you all that we need to be students of Christ in the year ahead. Now finally and quickly, I want to mention one other point of this story that jumps off the page at us. And that is the gift that Mary brings. It is an extraordinary gift. She gave the very best that she had. How different is that for most of us? We, we, we want Jesus. We, we want a slice of time in our week to give to Jesus. And so many of us will, will give him that hour on Sunday out of 24. And perhaps we carve out 10 or 15 minutes most days for a devotion. But we're busy folks, aren't we? But Mary, Mary brings to her relationship with Jesus the very best she can. Here's how it sometimes goes. 
I'll give my time, talent, and treasure. I'll give my tithes. But I'm only going to give so much because I need to keep back some more in case there's something that I would rather do with the rest of it. I'm not going to be extraordinarily over the top with Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to do what I need to do, but I'm going to leave it at that. Not Mary. Mary brought an extravagant gift to Jesus. So what are you going to bring to Jesus in terms of your time, talent, and treasure in 2024? Are you going to be extravagant with Jesus, trusting Him that He will always provide your needs? Or are you going to piecemeal it out? I can, I can give this much time, talent, and treasure, and somebody else can step up and do the rest. We have a, a budget with a big amount of money we've got to raise this year. Are y'all going to step up and give that money? Are we all going to step up and do that as much as God has blessed this church financially and in every other way? Are we going to come at the end of the year and say, now, you know, we didn't, we didn't quite get there. God didn't quite provide enough this year. Or are we going to be extravagant because we know that he who holds us in his hand will never let us go in true need? Mary sat always at the feet of Jesus, building that re relationship with him, and she gave back to him, because of who he is, extravagantly. And my prayer for this church, for all of us this year, is that we will become extravagant with our giving of time, talent, and treasure to Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we come, may we individually know what it means to be extravagant in our relationship with Jesus Christ, for we ask it in our Savior's name, amen. I would just uh, say to you that our closing hymn, which is 772, we're going to sing the first and third and fourth verse of that hymn. Let's stand together.
Receive now the benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or even imagine according to his power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations and for us here this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.